It's often said that we know more about the wider solar system than we do the oceans of our own planet. Indeed, just recently they found new kinds of fish living seven and a half kilometers down in a trench in the Pacific. While that doesn't exactly connect with tonight's story, it does show us why the seas are such an emotive subject for stories like this one. Well, my dear friends, another one from Dr. Creepen's Vault. The subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. Now, I think you know what time it is. It's time to sit back, relax with your favorite drink, and listen. The sea shone blue as a thousand sapphires under the red and gold rays of the rising sun. Jacob Smith had risen before dawn in order to witness the sunrise at sea. It was a truly breathtaking spectacle. He had expected beauty, and the sea had delivered. As his eyes scanned the shining surf, he spotted something large and dark grey. It briefly broke the surface before fully submerging itself once again. He had not expected to see whales this soon. He internally thanked his wife for insisting that they take a vacation. He had not regretted the whale-watching cruise once since the boat had left them behind, despite his protests before their departure. He'd been reluctant to leave his job for this adventure. It was not that they lacked the funds, or even the saved vacation time. The fact was that Jacob was somewhat of a workaholic, though he would never admit that to himself. His home life had become a maddening pursuit of his boss's favour. He would stay late at the office until the wee hours of the morning, busily working towards his next promotion. He would return, bleary-eyed, to a tired and resentful wife, only to leave again but a few short hours later. Soon his wife, Dolores, became fed up with his unhealthy behaviour. She insisted that he use some of the time off he had accumulated over the years. It's for your own good, she said over a Friday pot roast that had gone cold in his absence. To this, he promptly replied with, I'm doing all of this for you. He loved his wife more than life itself. He would sacrifice anything for her. I just want to give you the life you deserve. I don't care about the money, she cried. You're working yourself to death. All I want is my husband. I want to be able to give you what you deserve, he repeated. You deserve so much more than this. He gestured to the moderate suburban home he had inherited from his father. His father, like him, had wanted more for his family. A heart attack had taken him before that had become a reality. Jacob refused to be like his father. He wanted to make his happy wife before he died. Damn, Jacob, she barked, tears flowing freely down her cheeks. If you don't break this vicious cycle, I'll swear I'll leave you. It hurt Dolores to speak such words to the man she'd loved so much and for so long. She loved Jacob more than anything, and she would rather leave him than see him waste away like this. That finally won the argument. Nothing was more important to him than Dolores. He'd met her in a science class in high school. They'd both been outcasts, and together they had something that nobody else could replace. They'd never drifted apart over their many years of marriage. She was the voice of reason that kept him from wandering astray. She'd saved him from more perils than he could recall. No, he wouldn't choose his job over her, not in a million years. His boss, Samantha, had gladly given him time off, looking to reward her most loyal employee. It was actually his boss who recommended the cruise to Jacob. Samantha and her husband had gone on the same cruise the year prior, and she said it was quite relaxing. Jacob smiled as his wife wrapped her arms around his waist. Oh, isn't it lovely? she asked. <laughs> yeah, he smiled. I told you so, <laughs> she giggled, kissing him gently on the ear. He spun her around catching her in a loving embrace. 
He smiled down at her. You were right, my dear, he said as he pulled her close, kissing her lips. Her lips tasted of peppermint as he closed his eyes to enjoy the feeling of her in his arms. He breathed her faint perfume as it mingled with the salty air. He had never felt so content. An horrific scream of terror shattered their bliss like a brick through a window. His blood turned to ice as he pulled away from Dolores to see that the sun had fully risen, casting the scene in an uncannily bright light. He looked into her eyes to see the same panicked terror his eyes must have held reflected in hers. She spun around as if searching for the source of the horrible sound. Hello? she shouted. Are you all right? Oh, somebody help me! A young woman's voice called from inside the dining hall. There's a man in here. I think he's dead. Jacob and Dolores rushed into the dining hall to see a young woman in a white dress standing over the corpse of a large man. His blood stained a large portion of the crimson carpet a dark brown. There was so much blood that it was unclear where it was coming from. Jacob hadn't known how much blood the human body held, and now he wished he had never found out. The man's glassy eyes vacantly reflected the many lights of the overhead chandelier. They were sunken deep into the sockets by rot. The flies had not yet laid waste to his features, though it was clear that this man had been dead for a long time. Jacob looked at Dolores. Her hands were clasped over her mouth, and her eyes betrayed a look of shock and disgust that he had never before seen. He opened his mouth to comfort her, only to have his senses assaulted by the vile stink of the corpse. It smelled of something that had rotted under water, despite the fact that it was bone dry. The putrid miasma caused a wave of bile to rise from Jacob's throat. He bent over, purging the acidic foulness from his system. The vomit only worsened the stink of the room. How did the corpse stink so terribly already? He thought as he looked up at the lady with watering eyes. She had long, bright red hair. She was wearing what he assumed to be some sort of ancient nightgown, perhaps from the early 1920s. She looked as if she'd come from an entirely different time. Who are you? he asked, wiping off his mouth. My name is Valerie Crane, she said timidly. Her accent sounded archaic. This is my husband, Darius. Oh, I'll go to the captain, Dolores cried, running out of the dining hall with tears flowing in rivers from her eyes. Jacob watched her leave, only to turn back to see that Valerie was gone. Valerie, he screamed in frustration. His cries met no response, however, for Valerie had gone. He was now alone with the rotting corpse, along with the flies and maggots, alone with his trepidation and dread. He looked closely at the face, a wave of deja vu washing over him. He stared into those frozen eyes. He scanned the corpse's features, searching for any sign that his odd sensation wasn't unfounded. His heart pounding against his ribs as he recognized more and more of the dead man's features. His confusion grew with every second, for he knew not where he recognized the man from. The dead man blinked. Jacob stumbled back, cold sweat instantly soaking his body. The horror of what he had seen seemed to eat away at his consciousness. His vision blurred as he struggled to cling to the reality he had been safely grounded in for many years. No, 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 this is impossible, his brain shouted. It was trying to tell itself, and him, that what he had seen had not happened. Yet he could not convince himself that his eyes had been deceptive. So... He did what most humans would do when faced with the unknown. He ran. He dashed out of the rancid dining hall.
He fell to the deck, curling into the fetal position and sobbing loudly. His wet, racking sobs echoed off of the empty ship. The stillness now felt like that of the grave, rather than that of peaceful slumber, as if he were alone on a ghost ship. The sound of hurried footsteps broke the illusion of death as Dolores and the captain ran in his direction. They were accompanied by another man. He was a doctor. The Coast Guard had been called, and they were due to arrive in twenty minutes. Jacob, cried Dolores, kneeling by her husband's side. Oh, are you all right? Jacob could only sob as the doctor and captain ran into the dining hall. A wave of putrescence escaped the door as they rushed inside. What the hell? The captain's voice boomed from inside the hall. Dolores ran inside to see what was causing his distress, leaving Jacob to his tears. The reason for the captain's outburst was immediately clear as she entered. The body was gone, and in its place was a trail of rotted blood and flesh leading out of the room. It led below deck. A woman screamed, and the trio followed the blood trail to the source of the sound. A rich-looking lady was frozen in place, staring at the corpse that sat in one of the velvet-lined chairs in the lounge, a book in its hands, its dead eyes staring down at the page. The captain counseled the horrified woman while the doctor examined the body. Dolores stood there, in shock at what she'd seen. The stink of rot burned at her nostrils, but she stayed calm. She had no idea how she managed to maintain her composure, but it seemed to be working. The rich woman was crying profusely. The makeup, which she had caked onto her wrinkled face, was running down her cheeks. She appeared to be crying black tears. She wiped at her face, smearing her foundation revealing the paper-thin, wrinkled flesh beneath. Her sobs sounded animalistic and pathetic, a gurgling cacophony of phlegm and emotion. It was beginning to give Dolores a headache. What monster could do such a thing? The old lady cried between racking sobs. He looks like he was partially eaten, she wailed. Dolores wanted nothing more than for the old bag to shut up but she maintained her composure. For heaven's sake, she cried, will you help me get this poor soul out of here? The captain gladly handed over the crying hack. I'll go call the Coast Guard, he said. Dolores felt a pang of revulsion as a wrinkled hand clutched her arm. The old lady was weak and frail, nothing but a sack of bones. She was short and hunched, her hair dyed a disgusting mustard yellow. Her milky eyes were sunken deep into her gaunt face. You'll take care of me, dearie, she said in a voice that felt like sandpaper on Dolores' spine. Dolores nodded and led the old lady down the hall. She took the woman out onto the deck. As they passed by the railing, she felt a strong compulsion to throw the old crone overboard. She found herself leading the old lady to the edge of the ship. She positioned the hag between her and the railing. The thought of murdering this feeble and helpless creature brought a wave of pleasure to Dolores' mind. She pictured the twig-like limbs freezing up in the water. She pictured the gurgling sobs being replaced by the rasps of drowning. She could probably get away with it, she thought. What on earth am I thinking? Dolores thought, a sticky, uncomfortable shame creeping across her mind. How had she even considered murdering such a helpless and feeble old lady? She was repulsed by the pleasure the thought had brought her, even if it was only brief. No, she wasn't a bad person. She could never have done something so horribly vile, right? She quickly led the old woman to safety, as she tried to push the thoughts from her mind. On the way, she passed her husband. He was standing up, looking embarrassed by his earlier weakness. 
She was briefly disgusted by the sight of him, too, though she pushed this from her mind. Jacob was horribly confused by his earlier experience. What had made him go into shock like that? He couldn't remember. As he saw his wife pass by with an old lady, his confusion only grew. Wasn't she supposed to be fetching the captain? Why was she doing that? The body. He suddenly remembered that there had been a corpse in the dining hall. He flung open the doors, only to see the sight that had greeted the doctor and captain. The cadaver was gone. He followed the gore trail that led him to the once grand lounge where three corpses were placed in grotesquely lifelike poses. Darius sat upon an elegant velvet chair, a book in his lap and his eyes fixed intently upon the page. He appeared to have deteriorated significantly. The skin on his face was grey and bloated with seawater, while his hands looked as if they might simply fall off. His eyes, however, remained intact. They looked like marbles staring from the sockets of a melting wax figure. The captain and doctor were placed as if they were engaged in a fierce chess match, their stiff limbs positioned in a way that would suggest that they were arguing. Jacob could see what had killed the three of them now. Gaping holes in the backs of the dead men told him the story of how their hearts were ripped out from behind apparently with great strength. They were nowhere to be seen. Jacob observed the scene with a sort of unnatural calm that disturbed him more than the carnage that he was presented with. He knew that it should have made him sick, but he simply stood there trying to feel anything for the ruined men before him. In trying to feel, Jacob opened himself to something far more perverse than mere numbness. Like his wife, an odd pleasure gripped his mind. His heart began to race with excitement at the thought of something so deliciously violent. He began to salivate, and his stomach growled. He wondered what the still warm flesh would taste like. The thought of the coppery blood filling his mouth, and the texture of the twitching lumps of muscle sliding down his throat, brought a previously alien delight to his heart. He was sick, yes, but the wickedness of his thoughts excited him. He knelt down, ready to lick the rotted blood from the wood beneath his feet. As his lips met the coagulated mess, his tongue probing the cool substance, he suddenly came to his senses. He spat out the putrid vileness, gagging at the flavour. Tears now flowed freely from his eyes. The disgust at his thoughts and actions. He wished to purge the horribleness from himself, yet he had nothing in his stomach left to vomit up. With this thought, he stumbled out of the room to get himself a bottle of gin from the bar. Nobody would have to know, and he needed a drink. Dolores found herself in the bar as well, after her psychological ordeal. She had already finished a glass of wine and was starting a second when her husband came into the room. He did not speak a word to her as he plucked a bottle from the shelf. She watched numbly as he drained it without hesitation. She finished her wine and left without even speaking to him. The alcohol dulled her senses as she wandered aimlessly across the ship's deck. The sun had begun to set, and the world was bathed in a blood-red glow. Dolores did not realise just how strange this was at the time nor did she question the fact that the old woman had been the only other passenger she'd seen since the murder. That thought never occurred to her dazed mind. Rather, her eyes drifted lazily across the crimson waves, her mind lost in a haze. The Coast Guard could not locate the cruise ship on which the murder had allegedly occurred. The captain had sent them the ship's coordinates, yet the authorities could find nothing at the location specified. When they tried to contact the stranded vessel, they received no response. Dolores' eyes began to slip shut. The most she could do was push herself backward, onto the deck, so she wouldn't fall over the edge. Her world went black 
as she hit the polished boards of the ship's deck. Through the fog of unconsciousness, Dolores found herself standing on the deck of a great ship. Based on the clothing of the people surrounding her, she deduced that she was seeing the 1920s. She was clad in the attire of a rich lady. Beside her stood a tall man who seemed oddly familiar, though she could not tell where she knew him from. Scanning his features, realization slowly dawned on her. He was Darius Crane, the dead man. That must mean she was Valerie Crane, his wife. She followed him, the world bending around her until it was night time. She saw something dark crest the surface of the corner of her eye. It was like the whale she'd seen earlier, but she knew it was no whale. No, it was her salvation. Her husband, Darius, was a cruel man. This ancient thing would save her from his evil grip. He would pay for his evil. He would pay more than he could ever imagine. They would all pay. Everyone would feel the thing's wrath. Jacob saw Dolores as he wandered the decks, following some sense of purpose that was unknown even to him. He had a vague idea that he had to find Valerie, but he knew not why. He did not know that she did not exist, but he was beginning to suspect it. He carelessly stepped over Dolores, not even bothering to take her pulse. She could be dead for all he cared at the moment. He had to find Valerie. That was his purpose. Dolores, no, Valerie, stood upon the deck of the great ship, the night air as cold and damp as the mouth of a great cave. The thing had returned. She couldn't see it, but it spoke to her. She could hear its whispers behind her. It was speaking a language that she had never heard, but although she could not hear its words, she could understand the abstract concepts it conveyed. It wanted her to push her husband over the edge. It would do the rest, it told her. He would suffer eternally, it promised. Valerie did not see the old woman approach. She didn't even know that anyone else was awake until she heard the old crone gasp. She had seen the shadow behind Valerie. She had maybe seen the great beast beneath the waves as it projected the shadow. This didn't matter. Valerie stepped towards the crone. The elderly woman gasped. She saw Valerie's intent in her eyes. She tried to scream and run away, but it was too late for her. Valerie lifted the elderly woman over her head and threw her into the ocean below. The only one who was truly listening could have heard the screams over the din of the engines and the waves below. Valerie was listening. She smiled wider than she had before. This was going to be so much fun. Her husband was next. He was shaving before the bathroom mirror. She stood behind him as he ignored her, listening to his sickening pulse. The sound of his bones cracking as her hand ripped through his flesh was like a siren's call. His blood poured out, warm and sweet. It soaked her dress and hands. His heart twitched beneath her fingers, smooth and damp. It quivered weakly, twitching out its death throes. She pulled it from its fleshy prison, Staring at it as it rested in her palm, she raised it to her lips and delicately kissed it. The delicious, coppery aroma filled her nostrils as she tore it open with her teeth. Each twitching bite was the most divine thing she had ever tasted. She smiled. She left him there in that bathroom for a week. She claimed he was seasick and went about her daily life on the cruise. Nobody seemed to notice that every day there were fewer and fewer passengers aboard the vessel. A week later, as she lay in the tub, staring at her husband's corpse on the floor, the creature visited her again. It knelt beside the tub as a shadow and told her what to do next. By this time, there were almost no passengers left. 
She dragged her husband to the dining hall on a cool, bright morning. The beast crested the surface as she left him there. She smiled at it, returning to her husband's side. She screamed. Dolores' eyes opened. She was covered in blood. Her husband lay before her, dead. She ran screaming through the halls of the ship, desperate for help. Tears ran down her face. She was alone. She fell to her knees, sobbing. A deep rumble shook the boat. Dolores' face slackened. She calmly stood up, wandered onto the deck, and threw herself into the waves. The Coast Guard found the cruise ship floating empty on the water. There was no sign that anyone had ever been there, save for the blood smears on the floor and a note they found pinned to the door of one of the cabins. The note simply said, Forgive me, Valerie. Fantastic story there. Well, brilliant, wasn't it? I thought so. <laughs> Set that one to the sound of uh, a gentle rainstorm because, well, I just thought it sounded right that way. Well, comments in the uh, comment section below, as you'd expect. <laughs> and I will do my best to reply to as many as I can. And of course, I will be back again with you in just a couple of days. And I really hope you'll join me once again. Of course you will, I know you will. But until then, sweet dreams and bye bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>